Welcome back. Today we'll talk about the application of rigid body statics to problems in biomechanics. Typical examples include solving for the forces in muscles and ligaments, solving for the loads on joints and how loads are distributed at joints, computing reaction forces on the body during exercise or activity, and also other problems such as solving for the tension in the wall of a blood vessel or working out how changes in posture such as going from supine to standing affect blood pressure which would be a problem in hydrostatics. So many problems involve the musculoskeletal system and skeletal joints. The body is rigid but flexible and the flexibility is due to our joints or articulations. Joints provide varying degrees of mobility versus stability. There are synthathrodial joints that are tight fitting and have no mobility such as the joints between the bones and the skull. Then there are amphiathrodial joints that provide slight motion, for example the vertebral joints, uh, because they're constrained by intervening cartilaginous and ligamentous tissue. And then there are diarthrodial joints that they are, are the articulating joints that have the most mobility and include the shoulder joint, which is a ball and socket joint, allowing triaxial rotations and high mobility, but therefore that suffer from low stability and greater vulnerability to injury. Then there's the elbow, which is less mobility because it only has biaxial degrees of freedom, uh, but it's also less vulnerable to injury than the shoulder. Joint mobility depends on the nature and shape of the articulating surfaces, the structure of the capsular ligament, and the lengths and arrangements of the ligaments and muscles surrounding the joint. So let's take a look at a typical diarthrodial joint between two long bones. So here are the bones here and here. This is the ligamentous capsule and the inner surface of it is lined by the synovial membrane. Inside the joint is synovial fluid and at the ends of the bone is the articular cartilage that is also saturated with synovial fluid and forms the bearing surface for joints. And the space between the cartilage is called the articular cavity and the synovial fluid and cartilage allow for a very low friction joint. The types of diarthrodial joint include hinge joints like the elbow and ankle, pivot joints like the radio ulna joint between the radius and ulna of your forearm, condyloid joints like the complex joints at the wrist, saddle joints like the capometacarpal joint on your thumb, ball and socket joints like at the hip and shoulder, and gliding joints like the vertebral facets. Another important part of joint systems and joint mechanics are the skeletal muscles that generate the forces required to create uh, moments about the joints. There are three types of muscle, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Skeletal muscle, like cardiac muscle, is striated, unlike smooth muscle because of the uh, organized arrangement of contractile proteins in repeating units called sarcomere inside the cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle cells. Skeletal muscle is voluntary, unlike cardiac or smooth muscle. In muscle, the term contraction refers to the ability of muscles to shorten or to develop force. So there are several types of contraction. Concentric contractions 
uh, muscle contractions that result in muscle shortening. Isometric contractions are uh, muscle contractions where the muscle develops force at constant length, and eccentric contractions are contractions uh, that occur when the muscle is lengthening, such as when you're walking downhill or riding a bike. Agonist muscles are muscles that cause emotion, whereas antagonist muscles are muscles that oppose emotion. So some typical questions in joint statics would be, what tension must the neck extensor muscles exert on the head in order to support it in a particular position? When bending over, what's the force exerted by the erector spinae muscles on the fifth lumbar vertebrae? How does compression at the elbow, knee or ankle joint vary with joint angles or applied external forces? How does force at the femoral head vary with the load carried in the hands? And how do joint forces change as a function of body position, such as different positions adopted during yoga exercises? So the basic assumptions of joint statics fall into two main groups. The first is that the vector characteristics of the system are known so that we can draw the free body diagram. This requires anthropometric data, measurements on anatomic properties, such as the anatomical axes of joint rotation, of muscle attachment positions and tendon attachment positions, muscle lines of action, and the weights and centers of mass of body segments such as the forearm or the lower leg. The second group of assumptions are that the system can be simplified to be statically determinate, which means that First of all, there are no inertial forces so that the system is static. Second, that we ignore deformability of the joint tissues and treat the system as rigid. And thirdly, that only one muscle or muscle group acts. In real joints, not only are the tissues deformable, but more than one muscle or muscle group acts, and so we have to simplify a real system in order to make it statically determinate. And finally, that there's zero joint friction, and normal joints have very low friction, so this is usually a good assumption.